Alright, so why don't we start, right? Um, it talks about what is data, right? Um, and I'm going to get into why why even do this exercise. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, why don't some of you, you know, we've spent the whole day talking about data. Um, what is data? What's Data is information, okay? Who else? Data is the raw format of the information. Raw format of information, cool. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Plural of anecdote. Sorry? Plural of anecdote. Plural of? Anecdote. Plural of anecdote, yes, cool. I haven't read that one anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, all right, awesome. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? I want to quickly have a pen right now. So one was information, right? I'll just write info. The other one was you can get rid of this three. How do I do that? Pull it down and put it. Oh, it's probably like a remote or something. Yeah. Um, so info, right? That's one. Plural of anecdote. Yeah, I was just being. I was just being funny. <laughs> of anecdote. No, there's a point in there. Okay. Who else? Uh, you can take black color marker. Or here you go. Here you go. So we have information. We have plural of anecdotes. Somebody else, please come on. We talk the whole day about data. It's quantitative, not qualitative. It's quantitative, not qualitative. Okay. It's a quantitative. One Quant not qualitative. Okay, what else? Relevant information except in numbers. Bunch of info numbers. in numbers. Relevant info in numbers. In numbers. Okay. Anybody else? This is just set set of anything. That's set of anything is data. Okay, that's a good one too. Um. All right. So I'm a programmer. Okay, and I've spent the last 10 years or so doing programming and actually 10 years or so doing serious programming and before that like fun stuff right so as a programmer very early on you get used to this idea of abstraction right what we'll do believe me this is exactly what every programmer does right we'll go write 10 lines of code then we'll say this is a duck right we'll say this is a duck then we we'll believe in it. We'll be like so tied to the idea and we'll be like, this is a duck. It quacks like a duck, so it must be a duck, right? Like example, if I write, I mean, to take a non-programmer parallel, I write, write quack on a paper and I say, hey, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? Um, and then I will believe it. I will sell it to my customer. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you, go to a little kid and say, hey, look, you know, there's a really nice duck, go play with it. What's going to happen though? Um, and this is also another lesson you learn as a programmer very quickly that the kid's going to do something you didn't expect. He's going to say, you know what, ducks can swim. He's going to take that sheet of paper and put it in water, it won't swim. And he'll be like, <laughs> you're a duck slave, right? So that's one scenario. Another scenario could be, uh, so that's the scenario where your customer had a problem. Another scenario could be that somebody else who's building around your duck, right? So he, somebody decides to build a zoo. And they build, I don't know, some other animal. Oh, let's say it's, somebody decides to build a jungle. Right? And they build a lion. And the lion comes to. Lion? I don't know, maybe they can eat ducks. Okay. Fuck it. Uh, <laughs> the lion comes to eat a duck. And he says, This is a paper duck. This doesn't work for me, right? So this some other guy complains that you said this was a duck. But this isn't a duck. But I'm so passionately sold to the belief that this is a duck. Because I built the duck. Come on, how can I be wrong? Right? So. Very early on as programmers, you learn this idea of abstraction and you get tied to it, but slowly you realize that abstractions leak, right? And there's a very nice article by Joel Spolsky on leaky abstractions if you know, if you're a programmer, but um, abstractions, so you might simplify an idea and say, hey, anything that can quack is a duck, but that's not entirely your situation and you, in some cases that might work, but in other cases it will fail. Right? So abstractions leak. Now all programmers have realized this idea. They realize that you know stuff um, must be defined properly. Why? Because we take a small abstraction and we build bigger abstractions around it. And um, 
all of software is is fiction, frankly. Right? It's all of it is just signals or ones and zeros. So all of it is fiction, and just because I believe that the stuff underneath me is a database and I build stuff on it, doesn't mean it really is a database, right? So abstractions allow us to think like this, so we become, we, our mind gets set to it. But we also realize that abstractions break. And that's why as programmers, we realize that defining stuff is very, very important. So much so that if you go to standard bodies like the W3C, you'll, or you know, the Apache Foundation, which is doing like open source stuff, you'll notice people having pages and pages and pages of discussion around the definition of a small idea. Why? Because those small ideas or the small definitions are used to build bigger things. And it's easier to think at a large scale when you have good abstractions, but if your basic abstractions are wrong, you have a problem thinking at the large scale because things start to break. Right? So, the word data. Data, we've built so many abstractions around data, right? We've got data analysis, we've got data mining, we've got databases, we've got data quality, metadata, master data, information. So, this, the terms before this were stuff that BI people and data analysis people deal with. But information is something everybody deals with, right? Um, can somebody here define information? Yeah. Meaningful data. Meaningful data, cool, good one. Um, so, we do, so philosophers have spent a lot of time on this idea of information um, and knowledge. Even people, you know, as far back as Plato and Socrates have spent uh, a lot of good time thinking about what is knowledge and what is information and how do we learn and stuff. Um, so, I mentioned knowledge, right? Knowledge is another abstraction. It's based on data. Kind of sounds the same, right? Um, then, yeah, things like facts, right? That's also true data, maybe something like that, I don't know. There's truth, right? What is truth? So, a philosopher has also spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. Wisdom, right? And believe me, I'm not kidding you. I have read at least 10 papers in the last two days since I proposed the talk. Uh, which correlate data to wisdom, right? So, wisdom is the stuff, you know, Zen masters think about. So what the hell is this thing called data, right? I mean, if you think, if so much of our world is built around <coughs> so fundamental concepts in philosophy, fundamental concepts in computer science, fundamental concepts in this new science we've invented called information science, we're actually these days trying to invent a brand new science called data science, I'm not sure what that means. Um, so what is it? Sorry, a decrease even in data science. Sorry, there's a decrease? There's a decrease even in data science. There's degrees in data science already? Yeah. All right, I, I will debate that degree, all right. Uh, anyway, so what is data? And um, I was planning to ask that question at this point, but some of you have already done that. So we said, uh, first one was that information is data, right? So what's the difference between the two? What is information and what is data? Are they the same thing? She said meaningful data is information. Fair enough. Um, I'll not go on that one. Quantitative and qualitative information is data. Cool. Information um, in numbers is data. Something something, right? So we've got a bunch of definitions. And in this room, we have so many definitions. I'm sure there are others who've thought of other stuff and I'm not said it in the morning. Zainab said something about variables. That's also one of the theories. Uh, turns out, because I'm so passionate about this idea of having strong basic abstractions, four or five years ago when I started working with data analysis problems, um, I became a little worried of, you know, what the hell is this thing? It didn't make a lot of sense to me because if you go to a dictionary, right, it's the first place you go to find the meaning of a word. Um, you go to a dictionary and if you go to different dictionaries, dictionaries will define data in terms of Information, they define information in terms of data, they define knowledge in terms of data, they define data in terms of knowledge. So it's basically cross link. And it boils down to it if you really do an analysis of what means what, you get nothing out of the dictionaries. Right? But you get one thing, one basic idea. Oh, for yeah, this was my jab on what is data, we're not talking about that guy. Right, so that's one specification out of the picture. Um, 
data as the given. So in the Latin root of the word data um, is dare, which means to give. And um, hence uh, the past participle data or datum means something that is given, one item that is given. The plural of that is data, which is several things that are given. Now, what does it mean in this give? What does given mean in this sense? Given is the starting point of something. I'm tempted to think of math problems. Right? Math problems are things like given A is 2, B is 5, what is A multiplied by B, right? So given in this sense. So something that you start out with before you do anything. Right? It's the starting point. It's the it's in your program, it's the input to your program essentially. Right? Um, you could have uh, this example, or you could have a slightly better example. Given the length of a rectangle is 2 feet and its breadth is 5 feet, what is A? So, my question is did we add more data? What did we do? What is the difference between this statement? Given A is 2 and B is 5, what is A multiplied by 5? Given the length of a rectangle is 2 feet and its breadth is 5 feet, what is area? What is the difference between the two statements? Just the context. Just the context. Context, very important thing, right? So, alright. So, uh, I briefly mentioned, uh, let's remember that context point. Um, so, I briefly mentioned that if you do some initial looking into things, right, and you find that data, information, and knowledge seem to be related. We're not, we're not sure which is which. We don't know whether data is made up of knowledge or knowledge is made up of data because it's just a little weird, at least in dictionaries. But it seems that these three, three things are related. Now, if you start digging deep into what these three things are, then you come up with two main, actually three main subjects, which have, which have looked at these three words. The first one, in which is the oldest of them all, is the study of knowledge. It's called epistemology. It's a sub-branch of philosophy. Um, and that's where uh, scholars have spent a lot of time trying to define what is knowledge, right? And this stuff predates computers because people have been thinking about what is knowledge for a very, very long time. And in that paradigm, um, <coughs> There are several explanations, um, and I'm not going to attempt and define all of them. Um, there is one that makes a lot of sense, um, and that definition is knowledge is justified through belief. So I found this, and I, I saw that there seems to be a lot of consensus on knowledge is justified through belief, right? What, the, what does that mean? So. Uh, some brief look into you know epistemology uh, uh, research looks like okay something if you want to prove if you want to say p is knowledge then p must be true you must believe that p is true and you must have a justification of why p is true if you can do these three things then you have knowledge that p is true right so this is how they try to define it. And for now what we'll do is, since we're trying to define data, we just get this context and forget about the term knowledge, right? Let's look at data and information because they seem to overlap way too much. All right, so, so I, talk, I start talking about subjects, right? So I'll go back to my slide actually. So knowledge is defined mostly in epistemology. There's this other subject called information science, which is which is fairly recent. It's like last 50 years, 60 years, people have been talking about this thing called information science. Um, and there, they try to define all these three things. Uh, most of the research on the topic seems to deal with all, but their definitions of knowledge, in my opinion, are incredibly narrow. They're force-fitted into the idea that everything's, knowledge is all about computers, but it isn't, right? It isn't about information systems. Knowledge is a um, is a is an experience. It's something that happens in our mind. It's very hard to define. It's when we know something, we have knowledge, right? And how do you define this knowing? It's a pretty hard thing to deal with. Um, so I don't think that the information science definitions of knowledge do justice to knowledge, but the philosophy definitions are very interesting. 
Uh, so what we'll do is we'll look at data and information in the information science paper, right? Uh, and we forget about knowledge. So I, did, I started digging into several papers. Uh, <coughs> one of the first ones that I came about, uh, one of the first basic definitions that I came up, came up, came, saw was data has no meaning or value because it is without context and interpretation. Right, so this is trying to say that data is raw. Right, it's raw in your context. Whatever, you know, your setup is, data there has no context and hence you don't have any way of understanding that data. Because you don't have any way of understanding it, it means nothing, right? And because it means nothing, it has no value. But, you know what, as somebody who's, who's trying to make a career out of data, well, data has no value, are you kidding me? Um, so, uh, another definition. Uh, so the first one was from Jennifer Rowley, in this book called The Wisdom Hierarchy Representation of Data, Information, Knowledge, and Wisdom. Um, the second one is also, actually it's from a different paper. Um, this one, it says, data are discrete, objective facts <coughs> or observations which are unorganized and unprocessed and do not convey any specific meaning. All right, so there's some more things added here. So he's saying that, they're, one, they're discrete. They're, they're not continuous things, right? They're, there's one piece of data, there's another piece of data. Right, the, the third piece of data, the discrete things. Um, why? Because data are datums, right? So they must be discrete plurals or something. Um, objective facts or observations, uh, ignore objective facts, but or observations. So discrete observations, which are unorganized and unprocessed and do not have any meaning. This is a little more information. It tells us that you know it's unprocessed. It's the it's the given in whatever you're trying to do because you've not done any processing on it yet. This makes sense because it goes in line with the original root of the word, which is data is the given value, right? Um, so unorganized and unprocessed conveys no meaning. This is stuff to remember. So the same paper when they try to define information. They say information is data that have the data that have been given meaning by way of context. Now, which is where she was absolutely right. Data is information in a certain context. Uh, sorry, information is data given data plus context. Right. Um, so, if you have data and you have the context to understand the data, then you have information. Right. You have something that makes sense. Right. And and you have to think of this context very, very deeply. What is this context? This context is several things, right? Just let's take this English sentence uh, for a minute. This is conveying some information. How are you able to understand? Whoa, okay, uh, <laughs> he said five minutes. Okay, how are you able to understand this, uh, this sentence? Thoughts? How come I have written something, some white stuff on the board, and you can understand it. What is the context? How can you understand it? Data plus metadata equals information. Data plus metadata, okay, fine. Data plus context, same thing. I think context and metadata are similar things. But what is the metadata here? Because we have to open data camp. We're at the open data camp. But, <laughs> but, but, all right. Um, the context is, because I have limited on time, the context is that you know the English alphabet. You are the context, right? You know you have You've in the past learned a different piece of information, which is the English alphabet. And that's why you can understand uh, what is written on this board. So the context is deeper than what you might think of. Context is about who you are, what you've learned in the past, and what you have now, right? It's also about how I write it and stuff like that, who I am, who's sending the information, uh, <coughs> how is he sending it. So context is really broad concept. Uh, but once you have data plus context, you have information. This slightly broader definition says, information is data that have been organized so that they have meaning and value to the recipient, right? So information, the root of the word is informed, right? 
It's about informing somebody. It's about communication. So if it is about communication, the other person, so I might be sending this text. You may or may not receive it. If you do not know English, you will not receive it. So if you don't have the right context, this information is just data. It means nothing to you, right? So if we look back at our example, given A is 2 and B is 5, what is A multiplied by 5? This was our first example. So our second example was given the length of a rectangle is 2 feet and its breadth is 5 feet, what is the area? This, this thing, what he said was we added more context. We added more information. We did not change the data. And I'm rushing through it because I want to get to more forms. So, so far we looked at one definition of data, which comes from the root uh, of the word itself, which is data is something that is pre-given to you, right? Another definition that is explored in a lot of information science papers is data as a signal. This stuff is really very, very interesting. Why? Because it helps us explain all the data analysis abstractions we deal with. So data as a signal. And here, they try to define it. <coughs> I'm not going to uh, quote who these people are just to avoid, you know. So data are the sensory stimuli which we perceive through our senses. So data, very simply, you can think of it as Data are signals coming through your senses, right? You can hear data, you can see data, you can, you know, if you're a computer system, you can see it coming through your API. If you're a mobile phone, you can see it coming through your sensor. Um, but basically, data is stuff coming in as signal, right? Information is the meaning of that signal, right? But to have to understand the meaning, you must have the right context. So it's the same definition, slightly twisted. Uh, but it says the data is constantly coming at you. I, I heard something flap here, that is data. It just doesn't mean anything to me. That is why it's not something that I care about as information, right? But it is data. If somebody's moving around, it is data. I just don't care about it. I just don't try to comprehend it, so I don't treat it as information. So, um, this is an example from one of the papers. The noises that are here are data. The meaning of these noises, example, a car, uh, a running car engine is information, right? So if you have the context of having heard how, what is the sound that a car makes when it's running, then you can interpret the noises to be the sound of a car, right? So they, you know, I don't like this definition, but I also at the same time like it because it solves all, all the problems we face in the world of dealing data inside you know, computer systems. So, and he's not talking about computer systems at all, okay? But there are three important things to look at. Data is one or more kinds of energy waves or particles. So data is signal, forget everything else, right? Actually, think of it as light, right? So data is light. If data is light, he says, Data is light selected by a conscious organism or intelligent agent on the basis of a pre-existing frame of inferential mechanism in the organism or agent. Okay, what the hell? Um, so basically what he's saying is data is light, right? We assume signal is, uh, the signal we're dealing with is light. So data is light and I am the organized organism seeing the light. Then I have some context, right? I have the context that you know, something that looks green is green, right? I have that context. I I look at an apple, I because that light reflects at me, I see that this is an apple because I've seen the apple before, right? So I, I'm the person who has the context in my head. So I'm the intelligent agent in this case, and I have an existing frame uh, of, you know, my state or existing context. So basically, there's a signal coming at me, and I'm in the context. Um, I decide, given my context, what to keep, what to throw away, right? Because there's always signal coming at us. And this is true in computer systems a lot. Um, there are computer systems that are perceiving data from sensors, there are computer systems perceiving data uh, from several different things. Now, what is a database? Right? And this is where it all ties into what, what we do. A database 
is a record of this constantly coming in signal. And so there's a signal coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. We've just chosen to keep the record of a certain part of it, given our context. So let's imagine a business. A business has customers coming in, customers buying stuff, customers uh, just browsing. The business chooses that in my context, it is important when a customer buys something. And in that context, it chooses to record whenever a buy transaction happens, right? So, a signal in the recorded state. Now, let's think of our light uh, analogy, right? So, what is recorded light? A photograph, right, exactly. So, imagine data as a photograph of what happened in your business, right? So, data as a photograph of what happened in your business, right? Um, now, what if it was continuously several photographs, right? So you would imagine a video, right? Um, I would choose, instead of imagining a video, to imagine a reflection. What if my, my computer system was a mirror? There was light coming in, right? So now this guy. So my computer system is a mirror. Whatever business process system you want to imagine, my ERP system, my whatever system, right? So I have signal coming in, light, right? Um, I have a mirror, this is my system, and this system has a context, right? It knows that it must record by transactions. And this here is my database. So, my DB is a reflection, is a reflection of everything that happens in my business. So the data I have in my enterprise data warehouse is a reflection of everything that happened in my business. Now, why is this word reflection very interesting? It's interesting because uh, light displays all the properties of a signal we might want to imagine. If, for example, this mirror is bad, if this mirror is bad, my reflection is bad. So, okay, almost up. So, this is like last two minutes. Okay. So, if the mirror is bad, my reflection is bad, right? So the, the agent that is creating the reflection, if that agent agent is bad, the reflection is bad. And this is the, this is the stuff that we deal with in the entire, all the books that are all about data quality, right? They're talking about the fact that if you record it badly, you have bad data, right? And who's recording the bad data? The context. So that's, it's not just the system, in the context, there's also the person doing the manual recording, right? So in the context, there's also um, the medium of how I got the information. So if it was coming over a phone call, the phone call was jarred, and I did not get the right information. So if the mirror is bad, I get bad the reflection. Another thing that happens is that you can have multiple mirrors reflecting the same light, right? So if you have multiple mirrors reflecting the same light, you end up in this other data problem that we deal with is where we get multiple reflections. And these reflections might be out of sync. So there's a mirror in India, and there's a mirror in US, and as light passes, for some reason, straight line, I don't know. Uh, but let's say there's a mirror here in Bangalore, there's a mirror in Bombay, right? And I shine light uh, from here. Uh, the reflection first reaches Bangalore, then reaches Bombay. And uh, there's a time period. So the reflection in Bombay is out of sync from the reflection in Bangalore. And this is a, this can be a serious problem. Uh, it could also be that the mirror in Bangalore is more sophisticated. So the system in Bangalore is better at recording stuff than the system in Bombay. So again, the reflections are out of sync. The moment the reflections are out of sync, we deal with another common data problem is uh, which one wins, right? Which one is the correct one? And this again is a data quality issue. It can be it can be an issue of which one is master data um, and things like that. So um, what I've realized is that thinking of data of as a reflection of whatever happened in your business really works in the context we are in, right? Of data analysis. Why? Because then you can factor in this this the problem. All the problems reflections can have in your analysis, right? And then I want to make a final point, and then I will stop. I'm going to still follow this, right? Yeah, this is an idea that hasn't been explored, um, actually isn't even in a lot of uh, 
Actually, it's, it's nowhere. This is stuff that I've been thinking about. I think data, um, data is, is a social entity, right? Um, social objects are something that a lot of people in social sciences have defined as topics of conversation, right? So all of us, why are we here? We're talking about data, right? Um, so the reason we are here is, is data. Um, there have been a lot of smaller conversations around uh, toilet data and particular numbers and he talked about insurance got over a little while ago. Um, so singular data points are possible topics of conversation provided the right people are involved. In fact, the main reason we do data analysis is to help with conversations. We have business problems where we want to make arguments and we do data analysis to help our arguments. So. If conversations happen around data, why don't these conversations live with the data? What happens today is that you get a data point, you generate a report, you go to a meeting, discuss that data point, right? Or you go through a chain of emails discussing that data point. Or you post it on a blog and you get policy makers to discuss that data point. Um, you post it on a, you know, a newspaper posts it and then several people discuss that point. So there's conversation happening around data. There's even better conversation happening around higher levels of data, like in, you know, stuff that is visualized, for example, uh, into more useful information, summary statistics, things like this. There's conversation happening around data. Data is a social object. Data can trigger conversations if the right people are involved. Then we must think about bringing these conversations closer together because today they're silent. I have an email conversation with somebody, somebody else has an email conversation with somebody, um, there is value lost here because there is information that doesn't build back into the data. And that's why I think um, thinking of the social impact of data is very important. And this is where, this is in fact what is what open data is about, right? The whole idea is you open source data so that, so that there can be conversations that will trigger uh, better governance, right? So if that's the goal, uh, we need to bring these conversations together somehow. That's kind of my questions. Yeah. So I have a question. So you know, the end of your talk sort of focus around making information, right? Uh, sort of like joining different pieces of information or pieces or sources of information. What is your take on information science versus knowledge management? Right. Um, well, I, actually, information science has claimed that knowledge management, management is a subfield, uh, which is contradictory to the definitions in their papers, because um, they say that uh, information, when understood, makes knowledge. Right. Um, so if that's the case, information science is left behind. Right. Knowledge is a higher level entity than information science. But still, information scientists study management of knowledge. Now, the question becomes, and this is also there in a lot of information science papers, um, is, is knowledge something that you can manage? Um, the philosophy side of things believes that there are two kinds of knowledge. There's knowledge that happens inside us, and then there's universal knowledge. And they say that universal knowledge may be something you can manage. So maybe at the organization level, you can manage, manage certain knowledge. But you will still end up with knowledge that is inside people, which is why a lot of information science knowledge management theory deals with managing people and training them and improving their quality of knowledge. But it still lives inside people that knowledge, only a percentage of that knowledge ends up in computer systems. Even though the subject is called information science, um, knowledge still remains an experience you and I have individually. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Cool. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to rush through it.